That's he, amazing. What year is this? It was March 2nd, 1938. March 2nd, 1938. So he was 17 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but in that same, so, and I think he did this because he was, you know, had to get a social security number to go out and get a job. Hmm. And that same year, that same summer, his sister, Shirley, who was a couple years younger, went to the state office to see if there was any summer jobs, to get a summer job. And they took a look at her and they said, no, I'm sorry, there's no jobs for colored girls. Mm. Well, Shirley looks n negroid, as they used to say. Used to say, yeah. She, she couldn't pass. You know, Bliss, in an ideal world, I, I think your father certainly had a right to choose uh, his racial identification. Sure. But it wasn't a neutral decision for your father to make. No. Did this decision cost your father, do you think? I mean, was it a matter of turmoil for him? Yeah, I, I think it was. I think, um, I mean, he was, a, he was a family man. He loved our family, and I think that he loved his family. And I think he had terrible guilt about it. He thought that he had put his parents or his family in the past, but I think they really lived on in his heart, and he, he lived with that kind of guilt or struggle of not having them in his life. After he decided to pass, Anatole Boyard had minimal contact with his mother and his two sisters. His wife knew his true racial identity, as did a small circle of his friends. If he didn't look black, was he really black? If he looked white, why shouldn't he be white? But race isn't always a matter of black and white. As the child of a Cape Verdean father and an African-American mother, Peter Gomes knows this firsthand. Because of centuries of mixing among the African slaves, the Portuguese, and their mulatto offspring, many Cape Verdeans traditionally have seen themselves as something other than black. Did your father or grandfather ever talk about race with you when you were growing up? I don't remember explicit conversations, but the subject was very keen because my father uh, was described as having married a colored woman. Mm. And he identified as black. Mm -hmm. And there was some resentment with the other Cape Verdeans who tended to identify themselves as white. And when somebody like father crossed the line, as far as they were concerned, and married a colored woman. That just confirmed in their minds the worst. They would rather be at the lowest end of the white scale than counted as, as colored people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which makes sense in the 1920s and the 1930s. If you had a choice, that's what you did. So there are people darker than I who were Cape Verdeans who claimed themselves to be white. Mm -hmm. But to the African Americans, he was Cape Verdean. They didn't quite know what to do with him. <laughs> and the white people didn't know what to do with any of it. <laughs> so it was a very strange uh, sort of world. But... but this is like, in a way, for some people in this community, this would have been an interracial marriage. Oh, many thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Many thought of it. Mother was always Ms. Gomes' colored lady. Mm -hmm. And father was supposed to be thought of, uh, if he was, was consistent with the rest of the Cape Verde community, he was white. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember in school, uh, we still had to designate race. And I was always told, and there wasn't any problem, I was always told to put colored, and then eventually N for Negro. Perhaps choosing your race should be as simple as checking one box over another box, just as Anatole Broyard did and thereby creating for yourself a whole new life. For Bliss Broyard, however, Anatole Broyard's daughter, there are many questions that remain unanswered. You never had a chance to ask your father, but do you think that he felt that he could have achieved so much had he been identifiably black, or had he identified himself as a black man? Would he have been the Daily Review of the New York Times? No. I think, I think, I mean, I think it's definite that he never could have gotten that job um, if he had been openly black. Why did he share it with two of the three people he loved the most in the world? I think he didn't want us to have to, to struggle with our racial identity the way that he had. I think he just thought that we, he saved us from having that struggle. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, he didn't want us to be black. 
uh, that for him growing up in Bed-Stuy in the 40s and 50s, being black wasn't such a good thing. I think also that he felt that he didn't really have his past, did not have anything to do with us. And, you know, we were white, we looked white, we'd been raised white, and it didn't matter to us. What are you angry at your father about? I'm angry, you know, this Creole history is amazing. Um, my father's family in Louisiana and New Orleans are warm, you know, incredibly lovely people. My grandmother, what I've heard about her is, you know, was a, was a, a very warm, loving person. And I feel like I was cheated um, knowing my father's family. And, and I think that, you know, he withheld a part of himself um, because of this secret that I didn't get to know. And so there was a, a limit to, you know, um, what he shared with us, and, and I feel that I missed out on that. Since her father's death, Bliss has worked diligently to solve the mystery of why her father made the choices that he did. Passing is an uncomfortable and very complicated aspect of African-American family history. It's a phenomenon that many of us, quite frankly, share.